Okay, we're back. I'm Dave Vellante with theCUBE and you're watching Evolving Influx DB into the smart data platform made possible by Influx Data. Anna E. Stotis Giorgio is here. She's a developer advocate for Influx Data and we're going to dig into the rationale and value contribution behind several open source technologies that Influx DB is leveraging to increase the granularity of time series analysis and bring the world of data into real time analytics. Anna East, welcome to the program. Thanks for coming on. Hi, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, you're very welcome. Okay, so IOX is being touted as this next gen open source core for InfluxDB. And my understanding is that it leverages in memory, of course, for speed, it's a columnar store. Uh, so it gives you compression efficiency. It's going to give you faster query speeds. It's going to you store files in object storage. So you got very cost effective uh, approach. Are these the salient points on the platform? I know there are probably dozens of other features, but what are the high level value points that people should understand? Sure, um, that's a great question. So some of the main requirements that IOX is trying to achieve um, and some of the most impressive ones to me, the first one is that it aims to have no limits on cardinality and also allow you to write any kind of event data that you want, whether that's a tag or a field. It also wants to deliver the best in-class performance on analytics queries, in addition to our already well-served metrics queries. Um, we also want to have operator control over memory usage. So you should be able to define how much memory is used for buffering, caching, and query processing. Um, some other really important parts is the ability to have bulk data export and import, super useful. Um, also, broader ecosystem compatibility were possible. Um, we aim to use and embrace um, emerging standards in the data analytics ecosystem and have compatibility with things like um, SQL, Python, and maybe even Pandas in the future. Okay, so a lot there. Now we talked to Brian about how you're using uh, Rust and, and which is not a new programming language. And of course we had some drama around Rust during the pandemic with the Mozilla layoffs, but the formation of the Rust Foundation really addressed any of those concerns. You got big guns like Amazon and Google and Microsoft throwing their collective weights behind it. It's really, you know, the adoption is really starting to get steep on the S-curve. So lots of platforms, lots of adoption with Rust, but why Rust as an alternative to say C++, for example? Sure, that's a great question. So Rust was chosen because of his exceptional performance and reliability. So while Rust is syntactically similar to C++ and it has similar performance, um, it also compiles to a native code like C++, but unlike C++, it also has much better memory safety. So memory safety is protection against bugs or security vulnerabilities that lead to excessive memory usage or memory leaks. And Rust achieves this memory safety um, due to its like innovative type system. Additionally, uh, it doesn't allow for dangling pointers and dangling pointers are the main classes of errors that lead to exploitable security vulnerabilities in languages like C++. Um, so Rust like helps meet that requirement of having no limits on cardinality, for example, um, because it's we're also using the Rust implementation of Apache Arrow and this control over memory um, and also Rust, Rust, Rust's packaging system called Crates.io offers everything that you need out of the box to um, have features like um, async and await um, to fix race conditions, um, to protect against buffering overflows and to ensure thread safe um, async caching structures as well. So essentially it's just like, has all the control, all the fine grain control you need to um, take advantage of memory and all your resources as well as possible so that you can handle those really, really high um, cardinality use cases. Yeah, and the more I learned about the, the new engine and, and the platform, IOX, et cetera, uh, you, know, you, you see things like, you know, the old days, not even, to, even today, you do a lot of garbage collection, uh, in these in these systems, and there's an inverse, you know, impact uh, relative to performance. So it looks like you're really, you know, the community is modernizing the platform. But I want to talk about Apache Arrow for a moment. It's designed to address the constraints that are associated with 
analyzing large data sets. We, we know that, but please explain why, what, what is Arrow and, and what does it bring to InfluxDB? Sure, yeah. So Arrow is a, a framework for defining in-memory columnar data. And so much of the efficiency and performance of IOPS comes from taking advantage of columnar data structures. And I will, if you don't mind, take a moment to kind of illustrate why columnar data structures are so valuable. Let's pretend that we are gathering field data about the temperature in our room and also maybe the temperature of our stove. Um, and in our table, we have uh, those two temperature values as well as maybe um, a measurement value, timestamp value, maybe some other tag values that describe what room and what house, et cetera, we're getting this data from. Um, and so you can picture this table where we have like two rows with the two temperature values for both uh, our room and the stove. Well, usually our room temperature is regulated, so those values don't change very often. So um, when you have column-oriented um, column storage, essentially you take each row, each column, and group it together. And so if that's the case and you're just taking temperature values from the room and a lot of those temperature values are the same, then you'll, you might be able to imagine how equal values will then neighbor each other. And when they neighbor each other in the storage format, this provides a really perfect opportunity for cheap compression. And then this cheap compression enables high cardinality use cases. It also enables for faster scan rates. So if you wanted to find like the min and max value of the temperature in the room across a thousand different points, you only have to get those a thousand different points in order to um, answer that question and you have those immediately available to you. But let's contrast this with a row oriented storage solution instead um, so that we can understand better the benefits of columnar oriented storage. So if you had a row oriented storage, you'd first have to look at every field, like the temperature in, in the room and the temperature of the stove. You'd have to go across every tag value that maybe describes where the room is located or what model the stove is and every timestamp. You then have to pluck out that one temperature value that you want at that one timestamp and do that for every single row. So you're scanning across a ton more data. Um, and that's why row oriented doesn't uh, provide the same efficiency as columnar. And Apache Arrow is an in memory columnar um, uh, data, uh, columnar data fit framework. So that's a, where a lot of the advantages come from. <laughs> okay, so you basically described like a traditional database, a row uh, uh, approach. Um, but I've seen like a lot of traditional databases say, okay, now we've got, we can handle columnar format versus what you're talking about is really, you know, kind of native. It, is it not as effective, is the, f is the former not as effective because it's largely a, a bolt on? Can you, can you like elucidate on that front? Yeah, it's, it's not as effective because you have more expensive compression and because you can't scan across the values as quickly. Um, and so those are that's pretty much the main reasons why, why row-oriented row storage isn't as efficient as columnar-oriented column storage. Yeah, got it. Um, so let's talk about Arrow Data Fusion. What is uh, Data Fusion? I know it's written in Rust, but what does it bring to the table here? Sure, so it's an extensible query execution framework and it uses Arrow as its in-memory format. So the way that it helps InfluxDB IOX is that, okay, it's great if you can write uh, unlimited amount of cardinality into InfluxDB IOX, but if you don't have a query engine that can successfully query that data, then I don't know how much value it is for you. So data fusion um, helps enable the, the query process and transformation of that data. It also has a Pandas API so that you could take advantage of Pandas data frames as well and all of the machine learning tools associated with Pandas. Okay, you're also leveraging uh, Parquet in the platform. Mm -hmm. We heard a lot about Parquet in the middle of the last decade because there's a storage format to improve on Hadoop column stores. What are you doing with Parquet and why is it important? Sure, so Parquet is the column-oriented durable file format. 
So it's important because it'll enable bulk import and bulk export. Um, it has compatibility with Python and Pandas, so it supports a broader ecosystem. Um, Parquet files also take very little disk, disk space and they're faster to scan because again, they're column oriented. Um, in particular, I think Parquet files are like 16 times cheaper than CSV files, just as kind of a point of reference. Um, and so that's essentially a lot of the, the benefits of Parquet. Got it, very popular. Um, so NEs, what exactly is Influx data focusing on as a committer to these projects? What is your focus? What's the value that you're bringing to the community? Sure, so um, InfluxDB first um, has contributed a lot of different, um, different things to the Apache ecosystem. For example, they contribute um, an implementation of Apache Arrow and Go, and that will support querying with Flux. Um, also, there has been a quite a few contributions to data fusion um, for things like memory optimization and um, support of additional SQL features like uh, support for timestamp arithmetic and support for exist clauses and um, support for memory control. Um, so yeah, Influx has contributed a, a lot to um, the Apache ecosystem and continues to do so. And I think kind of the idea here is that if you can improve these upstream projects and then the long-term strategy here is that the more you contribute and build those up, then the more you will perpetuate that cycle of improvement and the more we in, will invest in our own project as well. So it's just that kind of um, symbiotic relationship um, and appreciation of the open source community. Yeah, got it. You got that virtuous cycle going, the people call it the flywheel. Uh, give us your last thoughts and kind of summarize you know, where, what, what the big takeaways are from your perspective. So I think the big takeaway is that Influx Data is doing a lot of really exciting things with Influx DB IOX. And I really encourage if you are interested in learning more about the technologies that Influx is leveraging to produce IOX, the challenges associated with it and all of the hard work questions um, and I just want to learn more, then I would encourage you to go to the monthly tech talks and community office hours. And they are on every second Wednesday of the month um, at 8.30 a.m. Pacific time. Um, there's also a community forums and a community Slack channel. Look for the um, Influx DB underscore IOX channel specifically to learn more about how to join those office hours and those monthly tech, um, tech talks, as well as ask any questions they have about IOX, what to expect, um, and what you'd like to learn more about. Um, I, as a developer advocate, I want to answer your questions. So if there's a particular technology or stack that you want to um, dive deeper into and want more explanation about how InfluxDB leverages it to build IOX, um, I will be really excited to produce content on that topic for you. Yeah, that's awesome. You guys have a really rich community. Collaborate with your peers, solve problems, and, and you're super responsive. So really appreciate that. All right, thank you so much, Anna East, for explaining all this open source stuff to the audience and why it's important to the future of data. Thank you, I really appreciate it. All right, you're very welcome. Okay, stay right there. And in a moment, I'll be back with Tim Yoakum. He's the Director of Engineering for Influx Data. We're going to talk about how you update a SaaS engine while the plane is flying at 30,000 feet. You don't want to miss this. <laughs>